I do want to welcome everyone to Dawn at Oaklawn. I have been very blessed in my career to have interviewed the greatest names in the sport, learned a lot, hopefully given some new information to our race fans. I'm very honored to be joined by jockey Keith Asmussen and his Hall of Fame trainer dad, Steve. Can we get Steve a mic? Oh, it's right in your chair. I didn't even see it. And I did learn last night, I asked Steve walking out when he was walking out with his wife, Julie, I said, have you and Keith ever been interviewed before? I've interviewed Keith, I've interviewed Steve numerous times, but this is the first time that you guys are sitting down together. I definitely believe so. <laughs> Couldn't be more excited to finally have my Don at Oaklawn. I feel like I've watched a hundred <laughs> no, of them. That's a big deal, Keith, to be at Don at Oaklawn. Um, so many of you do know that Steve is in the Hall of Fame, the winningest trainer in North America. Is there a tally, Steve? Is it is he Peruvian or from Uruguay, the guy that's a few few hundred wins in front of you? I believe he's uh, in Peru, um, and I believe I'm about 500 behind him, but... Uh, You're also you know, about 10 years Ju younger. Julie's, uh, you know, got me on a diet, trying to keep me around <laughs> a little long, try, try to catch him, you know, I just kind of... Might have to just outlast him. <laughs> well, at the rate you're going, I, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Um, a lot of us do remember uh, Curlin, Gunrunner, all of the Breeders' Cup wins. Pretty much racing is in the Asmussen DNA. I'm going to guess, Keith, that you were on a pony or a equisizer before you learned to walk. Would that be accurate? Very accurate. <laughs> I, my first memories are on the backside or at the racetrack, so to say the least, yes. So Steve, actually, I don't know if y'all know this, but Steve started out as a jockey like his, uh, I see the giggles ensuing, started out like his dad and his brother Cash, who was a champion over in Europe. Um, to put it nicely, you just grew out of it. <laughs> and, oh, as you, I'm two jockeys now, so, but uh, yeah, it, it, as Nate said, just we grew up in a racing family, just very unique circumstances. My fa father was a jockey. Uh, my mom was a trainer. Got one older brother that uh, had a tremendous amount of success riding. And we, what racing has done for the Asmussen family cannot be measured. And it is, it, it's a gift that keeps on giving. And um, as good as it's been, I, I've never enjoyed anything more than being able to leg Keith and Eric up on horses. And uh, it's just an amazing sport we're blessed to be a part of. Keith, at what point in your life did you know, and uh, Keith is extremely well-educated, has a master's in accounting. At what point did, did you know that horse racing was going to be the career path for you? I was always blessed to grow up around it. You know, being born and raised in Arlington, Texas is 10 minutes away from Lone Star Park. Um, always around the backside, started hot walking real young, then I grew my own, and it, it had always been an infatuation with the backside and being around the horses. Um, was proficient in school and did have aspirations of going to college and getting my degree, but it was, it was something always, um, never really doubted I'd end up doing. Well, I love, I just noticed that Keith is wearing a D. Wayne Lucas <laughs> racing hat. Is that, is that allowed in the barn or is this something that's, that's outside? Well, I, I need to get used to it. <laughs> it, it was, it, it's, you know, uh, coach has been a, a big part of uh, our story, my parents' story as well. Um, they were friends long before I was thought, of, let alone Keith. And then for Keith to have this success that he's having for him now, is, it's tremendous. It's an amazing thing. You asked Keith about, uh, you know, starting in racing. I, I remember us driving uh, back from Laredo, visiting my parents at the farm where all of us got our, our horsemanship and our education started in, after the holidays. And he uh, a very good heart to heart about his intentions and that he uh, actually felt that I'd kind of Kept, it, kept him in the barn at arm's length and pushed education on him. And it, it was very eye-opening for me, you know, his, his desire to be a part of this and how much he actually knew. Uh, I was just uh, wanting him to experience the things that, that I felt that I'd missed out on and, you know, and just 
the grass isn't always greener and the, for him to have the level of success doing this and doing it as well as he is couldn't be a prouder parent so i like to say be, behind every successful man is an amazing woman and you both have a several amazing women behind you first your mom marilyn who is one heck of a spitfire love her to death and also your wife and your mom julie what advice did she give you, Keith, when you decided that you were going to be a, have a jockey as a profession? Right, I'd always been on horses and loved galloping horses in the morning, and it wasn't really until COVID hit in 2020 and I was able to you know, gallop for a longer stint growing up around the racetrack. It's, it's hard not to admit that everybody kind of wants to be a jockey, and I, I, was, I was very lucky. I had transparent conversation with my parents. I was like, this is something I want to try. I don't care if it's one race, it's something no one can take away from me. It's just something I really want to experience. And I was just really upfront with them and they've supported me all the way and I'm truly blessed in that dimension. So you not only had one son decide to make this a career path, but his son Eric is also a professional rider as well. Raising three boys, did you think, okay, I'm gonna be legging them up one day in the afternoon? Uh, at their size, um, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and honestly, for them to, um, it, it, the success we've had is obvious, and they could have sat in the turf club and been an expert their whole life by not putting themselves out there, and for them to show the discipline at their height, to maintain the weight and be as good as they are, and just uh, horse racing is very unique, and um, you, you stand here and talk about it, accomplishments, and that will not do us a favor in the first. You, you, you have to do it again, and nobody walks over with any plans other than winning. And it, it can be the most humbling thing there is, is to you know go through a cold spell or something. But for both the boys, you know, Darren put themselves out there and be willing to be in the arena. Um, I, I think is the most important thing. You'd mentioned you know Julie and what she's done. Well, thanks to Equibase, you can look it up and. Uh, my stat, I think I started in 86, and uh, me and Julie got together in 95. I, I would have to say she deserves more than a little bit of credit for, uh, you know, getting us on the, you know, the focus and the support when needed, and, you know, and pat on the head when you need it and a kick in the hiney when you do, you know. But uh, both of us, you know, all of us, uh, what Julie has done for us is immeasurable. Horse racing is a family sport. Your parents, your parents and grandparents, and I love the Christmas photo of, is it 19 or 20 tacked horses with all the family members in Laredo. If that is not a picture postcard for the Asmussen family, I don't know what is, because it's not only your profession, but it's a passion. It has to be to put in this amount of work, the dedication, and especially for you and your brother now, the diet, just, just the mental game in itself. What is that, is there more pressure, do you think, Keith, because of your last name when you get out there in the afternoon? No, I, th I think I really simplify it. I, I was always just so ready to do it because the, the feeling of being on a thoroughbred racehorse at full flight that's second to none. And I mean, when you take a step back and just really appreciate that, it's. I don't, I don't believe I really get nervous over expectations or anything. I just feel incredibly blessed to do it. We obviously have to be competitive, have that competitive drive. You're very competitive. How do you decide when you have a horse racing and your son is on a rival? How do you, do you separate the two or is it a, a combination of emotion? Uh, it's very separated of running multiple horses in races nowadays is necessary, uh, mainly usually just to get races to fill, so you're that. Um, I th think that our, our focus is always from point A to point B with individual horses and what's best for them. And, and that, is, that is our focus uh, all the time, and we, we stay very consistent with that. You do, you get in circumstances like the Arkansas Derby, where it was quite obvious our horses uh, weren't in the 
uh, finish close, and of course your visual focus uh, went to where Keith was on Wayne's horse, but I, I think that's in the moment. But your plans going into a race, we stay very consistent with and try to execute that. So obviously the family has a long-standing relationship with one of the greatest names to ever saddle a horse, D. Wayne Lucas. Ironically, Keith didn't win his first race at Oaklawn for his dad, but it was for Wayne Lucas. It was very cool that you and Julie were in the win picture. And I think it's kind of cool that Keith accomplished something that you never have. I mean, not to rub dirt in the wound, but Keith won not only his first stakes race, but his first graded stakes. And unfortunately, you never accomplished that. Again, I'm gonna highlight your son here. But there began a relationship with Wayne. It's obviously great to have confidence from your dad, but what's it like to have that level of confidence from somebody like Wayne Lucas? Oh, it's, it's, talk about an invigorating feeling having someone like that on your side. A level of horsemanship that is second to none. I uh, arrogantly think I know a lot, and then you start <laughs> comparing. You're like, dang, you are literally an ice cube compared to an iceberg of just knowledge and experience in this sport. Papa Rocket, my first winner at Oaklawn, couldn't have been a more sentimental win for the coach, just given the familial history. And even with Lemon Muffin, my first graded stakes win is an incredible source of pride, very emotional. I remember I was very. Um, <laughs> upset. I had, I was supposed to ride Rivet, who's o <laughs> Mr. Oaklawn, in the chick laying at Baltimore, and the Thursday before, like three days before the chick laying, I broke my finger at Lone Star, and it was just something you're always working towards, and you're so tunnel vision into it, and sometimes, you know, things like that happen. You have to take a step back, and you're to kind of come together and make something like that happen it was incredibly emotional for me. I was actually standing in the tunnel or to go into the paddock with Wayne when they were on the track for the honeybee. Lemon Muffin was a maiden. She'd never won a race prior to the honeybee. And Wayne was talking about somebody had called him and said, hey, can we get you to scratch to go into a maiden race? And Wayne's response in true Lucas fashion, well, no, I'm gonna win the, I'm gonna win the honeybee with her. So that kind of confidence that he not only has in his horses, but who he puts on has kind of segued into the Arkansas Derby and now into the Kentucky Derby and the Kentucky Oaks. You've been to those events your entire life, but it's gonna be very different this year. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, every single Derby I can remember I've been at, except with the exception of last year, given that I was riding here and so to actually participate this year is beyond a dream come true. I mean, I'm sure I've been told by, by jockeys and trainers, and I've done it myself, when they play that My Old Kentucky Home, it's just something clicks. Like, the, and jockeys aspire their entire career to ride in the Kentucky Derby. Yes, they want to win it, but just to be seen on that national stage. It's only run once a year. It's only for those two minutes. Have you, has, have you actually, have you processed that yet? Like getting ready in the room, it's the best three-year-olds in the country, the best jockeys in the country. I would be washing out like a filly getting ready to go to the shed. <laughs> um, definitely keeping the excitement at bay, but um, admittedly it's the, it's the level you want to compete at. It's the pinnacle of the sport. And to even experience something like that is such a blessing. I mean, it, it's monumental. As many races as Steve has won, all the grade ones, and I think I counted correctly, 80 grade ones. Why is it so damn hard to win a Kentucky Derby? You've, he's come so close. He's run twice uh, with 2011 with Nero, 2017 with Looking at Lee, 2022 with Epicenter. Why is the Derby so hard to win? Because uh, it's so special. I, I think that... Uh life needs that carrot out there and uh, I just love being part of the process and it, you've mentioned the tough defeats nothing you know the epicenter in 2022 looked home and cooled out it just uh, can uh, it's almost 
you know, the best story wins. I guess it's just well, eventually we'll have to be the best story and go from there. Obviously, it's full emotion when you have a horse going to the Kentucky Derby. Track Phantom is on target. What's it now mean to have your younger generations, your, your, your kid, riding in the Derby? Uh, it's, it's the level that he's at. And I, I think that uh, it's growing up around Keith, I think that he's excelled uh, in everything he's done all the time. But uh, it's not normal um, for him to start riding like most people. I remember when he rode his first race at uh, Lone Star, the coverage that it got, the, the local channel came out and covered it, the, all the interviews and stuff, just because of it being unexpected, you know, being a kid, but driving up and down the road recently, just thinking about the level of success that he's having. It, he's been around it. It's not foreign to him. Right. Just like going to the Derby. I mean, it's he has been privileged to these conversations and the process of getting there and what it takes and how good of a horse. You, you know, you sit up here and you, you say uh, pleasantries and all that, but he, he's seen the tough sides of it. And I think that um, it, it shouldn't be surprising. I, I think that very much the difference um, riding him in the afternoon is the horsemanship that he's brought to these horses. It doesn't, uh, he knows more going in uh, about them and then uses it effectively. I think there's a lot of uh, jockeys that are fine physically. You know, they're very much capable of, of riding well, but uh, riding good horses well is a completely different thing. How you use that talent when you do, the nuances of that is what takes uh, having success at the level we're referring to. Well, it's very interesting, and I think I said this to you at the end of last meet, Keith, when he rode here, how much you can see the advancement and the progression. I like to think of Keith as a, as a very cerebral rider. You read the race. You know exactly where you want to be in position to get that maximum outcome. And to see, I mean, I was going through photos the other day and I see all the milestones that you've had at Oakland when you and Eric are this big and to see I mean for me to see him grow up I mean it's it's a very cool feeling to see you know we see horses out here train how much better they get but to see you progress and really become elite at such a quick age and it like Steve said he has been entrenched in this sport from the womb basically to be put on that national stage already in your career, what what does that feel like? Uh, an, an incredible source of pride, just like you spoke of. Um, a cerebral rider, I, I do think that's what I aspire to be, is to show a level of horsemanship where I understand the horses under my care and try to put them in the best position to win. I feel like it's very easy to fall into the trap of riding defensively to where it doesn't look like it's your fault. I can easily use a lot of energy to make sure my horse isn't compromised by a position and then, you know, flatten late and come back and tell the trainer, oh, no excuses. When you yourself know, when you, <laughs> like, the race can pan out so many different ways, but if a level of understanding for your horse to give them the best opportunity to be themselves, it's, I think that's the rider I aspire and, and to be. And that's, that's evident from the way that Eric, or Keith, and slip. The way that Keith handles himself, not only off the track, but on the track as well. Let's quickly talk about today. Steve is very, very busy. You've made basically every milestone. Are you aware that you're 10 wins away from having the winningest meet in Oakland history? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Do you, what? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't put any pressure on anybody or anything. Not yet. So no, constantly. Oh, I'm sure. So uh, it's crazy to me also that it's very common to see owner trainer Steve Asmussen very busy in the claim game. I remember last year we asked, I asked you, why did you claim an Arky bred maiden 12-5? And your response, because they write the race. If they write a race for it, he is going to have a horse for it, and he is going to have probably one of the top contenders for
for it. Steve is right next to State and Flurry for leading owner. How many horses do you personally own right now? 73 today. Oh my gosh. And how many total horses are you down as trainer? Uh, 326. That's unbelievable. That level of organization. It's the perfect storm. Um, I think of, you know, Darren Fleming here, Scott Vlasi in Kentucky, uh, Pablo in Texas. We've, we've been doing this together and have grown to this level um, over 30 years. And what we've learned, and you, you think about the boys and how close they are with them. And I mean, it, it's, it's a family and we've done all of this together. What we've learned, we've learned through uh, trial and error and conversations with each other. And we're all aim, aimed at the same thing. It was just a, a perfect storm as far as where we started doing it in the Midwest uh, for whatever we could get, had the same passion and we've been um, blessed with the opportunities of the greatest racehorses of all time and enjoy the process and want to continuously get better at it. And so uh, I think that everybody will, you know, talk about what you've won. You're not surprised by the ones you won. You're surprised by the ones that got beat. I mean, that's the goal, the plan. And if you didn't think you were right, you'd do it different, you know. So, And it's something that you can continuously improve on. I just can't say enough about uh, how uh, rewarding and fulfilling horse racing is. So Team Asmussen, obviously a very well-oiled machine and they always show up on big signature days like this. Uh, Steve is looking to repeat not only the Count Fleet Sprint victory, but also this year's Apple Blossom. Let's real quickly talk about the Count Fleet Sprint. Steve has won this race five times and including the last two years, he has three chances to win it today. Uh, best chance probably, I like to think, is gonna be Skelly, who is an absolute monster of a sprinter. Ricardo Santana in the irons, he's a millionaire. He was actually last year's winner in the Count Fleet Sprint. Uh, last year he won from the bell. He loves Oaklawn Park. Talking about Skelly, Ribbit, who Keith will ride. It's got to be one of your favorite horses. Absolutely. Also, Jackson Traveler, who is a multiple grade three winner and most recently did win the grade three Whitmore in his last start here. Steve, when you do have three contenders uh, in a, in an abbreviated field, how important is, is race makeup, pace? How do you determine what to tell everybody? Or do you just say good luck? I think in this circumstances, good luck will come into play. I am not 100% on running Rivet today because of Skelly, and I have scheduled a call with uh, Heidelbros today to discuss that because when Skelly's on, he would, um, as you mentioned, he's the fat, quickest horse in the race, and he does have the variable of traveling to Saudi and coming back, and is he the same Skelly? So, you know, we're, I still have that to sort out today. And uh, I, I think that the weather, uh, perfect conditions, yes. you know, so kind of was waiting to see that as well from all the rain we had earlier in the week, but it couldn't, couldn't be any prettier today. So we're, that's still yet to be decided. But uh, is, if Skelly runs his typical Oaklawn race, he is the fastest horse in the field. So after Skelly ran at Oakland, he then traveled to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia and was second in a million and a half dollar sprint over there. One thing that your barn has definitely become accustomed to is international travel, international racing. How much does that take out of a horse? Say, for example, Skelly in not, they have to go through a whole quarantine process. So the travel, the just getting used to new surroundings, do better horses typically adapt quicker? I think personality. I think it's all of us travel a little different. It's the same thing with horses. I do believe that it is a benefit for Skelly. Uh, being a gelding, being an older horse, he, he does have a, 
uh, very nice disposition as far as handling. He's not hard on himself, doesn't get overly wound up, uh, trailer, travel, things like that. Um, with all that being said, he still did go to Riyadh right. <laughs> during the meet and, and it's not came like he back. Went to sat, and the, the quarantine on your way back is a week of mistraining. You know, they're, they're, it's not ideal, but he's still skelly and it's still a race. But because a horse like that is so fit, they're, they're constantly training. A week is probably like, it is a vacation for them, but I'm sure by the time he does come back, he is ready to go. It, it's, it's different, it really is. And we just tried to keep him from doing too much off the bench when he came back. And then, you know, his work a, a week ago was concerned that he wanted to do too much. And uh, a couple of days off of it, just a, a touch tireder than off of a normal work. but. Uh, about Thursday of this week, he was very lively and back to himself. And this morning, he's bright and alert and looks like he's ready to play. Steve has won the Apple Blossom three times, most recently last year with the standout Clarier. Uh, Keith will be riding Bellamore, who does represent the barn, finished a neck in front of a horse who does return in the field free like a girl. Uh, and that was two back in the Houston Ladies Classic, was third behind runner-up Misty Vale, last out in the Azari, in the money, all five at the distance. What are your thoughts on Bellamore? Bob Baffert has shipped a horse in, Sappy Joseph has shipped a horse in. Keith, I'm gonna send this one to you. What are your thoughts on Bellamore? Do you get on her in the mornings, I assume? Yes, I do. And even before she won the Houston Ladies Classic, she was training here. I've been lucky enough to be around her, an incredibly classy and talented race mare. I, <laughs> have a world of confidence in her today. What are your thoughts about the, the pace scenario and just because there's I'm they're anticipating a lot of people here today. What are your thoughts about the whole process for her? It's a tremendous opportunity and why we're in this. It, it's uh, it's going to require a better race than her last two and we feel that we that we're going to get a faster race from her today because it'll be necessary. I couldn't um, I, as Keith mentioned, he was working her before she went to Houston. Obviously, we were pleased with her, perfect outcome with her there. Came back for the Azari, uh, but uh, all systems are go. She's, I love how she looks, I love how she's handling, and I think her head's exactly where it needs to be, and she's going to uh, put it out there this afternoon when it matters most. So right now, in regards to the Kentucky Oaks, our pretty woman is 16th on the list, second in the Fairgrounds Oaks. Only 14 do make the starting gate in the Kentucky Oaks compared to 20 in the Derby. If there are some defections, because there's still a long way to go until the first weekend in May, is there intent on being able to run her in the Kentucky Oaks? I do, and I expect to get to, you know, from your, when you're in that position, you obviously do a little homework and I do expect her to be in the field by what we're uh, believing to be true about the horses with more points in front of her and she's training uh, regularly at Churchill right now you had mentioned her second in the fairgrounds Oaks only her third lifetime race her first two races were victories and she wasn't tested much in either so I think this is an opportunity for her to take the fairgrounds Oaks and make a nice jump forward from a um, up to speed uh, <laughs> angle. Track Phantom is going to represent Steve in the Kentucky Derby. He was second in the Risen Star behind the Kentucky Derby points leader, Sierra Leone, and then fourth in the Louisiana Derby to Catching Freedom, who did win our Smarty Jones. He's got 70 points, obviously going to make it into the field. Having a good three-year-old has to be a good feeling, especially maybe in January or February. How much of it is, is it harder to, to get a horse ready or to keep a horse sound and fit uh, and it's happy? A, it's a very individual um, horse to horse and uh, the circumstances. We had an unbelievably wet winter everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, can, as everybody's well aware. Um, and feel very good about the condition which track Phantom has got there. I think that, you know, when you get this close to the Derby, it starts sorting out right. what were the key preps. Obviously, the day of the Risen Star uh, it felt like a good race, but now it's proven to be 
uh, probably the, where the most horses that are still considered for the Derby were gathered up in one spot, and he performed well. We have the uh, added blinkers to his equipment. Um, watching the Louisiana Derby, you know, uh, run in the twilight, you know, kind of lights kind of look like he lost a little concentration at the quarter pole coming in the stretch. Mm -hmm. And obviously you cannot have anything like that uh, against that level of competition. And he has had success at Churchill. And uh, we think that he is going to rebound nicely and get back to his earlier in the year form. It seems like sometimes that first Saturday in May separates the men from the boys, so to speak. But there's obviously a lot of racing luck that has to go into it. With that it field is, of 20, yeah. going into that first turn, everybody's jockeying for position. Did you give Keith any advice of when you did find out that he was going to be riding that first weekend in May at Churchill, or are you just tickled pink? Uh, at this stage, tickled pink. But we've, we've discussed and rewatched the derbies from our angle and uh, he, he's been a part of so many of them you know <laughs> for 25 years from the first ones we were ever in and you know where where how they broke where their post position uh, the irony of it you said you know it it separates them uh, more than half the field's proven not to ever get over it right it, it's just you're i think that that's like people you know spiders anything else some of them meet what they can't handle, can never even muster up what they used to be able to handle. And it is those sort of circumstances that sorts everything out. But you'd mentioned our second place finishes when looking at least second from the one hole. Oh, when I it's, loved him that year too. Exactly, coming off a third in the Arkansas Derby. And you, you know, you draw the one hole in, in a 20 horse field. But Corey Lannery worked out a beautiful trip from there. And, uh, it is capable. Nero, who you mentioned, was second also from the 20 hole with Nakatani. Uh, post positions are a very unique thing. Mm -hmm. it, it, where you draw in a 20 horse field is, of course, important, but not near as important as who is next to you and what their tendencies are from a horse individually, from riders individually, and, and what they'll do. And so the insight that Keith will be able to take into the Derby will be far more than even several of them uh, that have rode it before. Um, I think that uh, you mentioned him being cerebral. Uh, it is so, f I, the one thing about uh, Keith um, that I know to be true is he, he can take more pressure than anybody I've ever ridden in my life. And we're not, no, getting here is never, been easy and we don't take anything for granted you know our your motto is either everything matters or nothing does and I drive away from the races going wow that was too much you know you just but it, he deserves honesty he gives honesty and so when, when I say that the difference is is that and he acknowledged it earlier when you talk to a rider after a race or something there quick to point out what somebody else did that affected them. We're, we've all been there, you know, and you just, I, I love the perspective of road briefly or whatever, but my dad riding my whole entire life growing up and my brother riding before me is, you know, it just, you know, that one's over. An excuse for it doesn't help. How do we move forward? And I, I think that's the education that Keith brings to this that, uh, that separates him. Keith, who were some of the guys in the room that kind of maybe pulled you aside after certain races, helped you watch a video, helped you break, and I'm sure you, you already knew how to break down a replay, but that kind of did pull you aside to, to maybe give you some advice or, or words of encouragement? Uh, one of the coolest things about Oakland is the rider colony here. It's one that I admire, respect, and try to emulate in multiple different dimensions. Um, starting up, Ricardo Santana is probably the one that helped me the most as far as just a million different scenarios of, oh, you have this and you're here, but this horse is doing this, you need to be here instead of this part. And I mean, my father is my biggest mentor, coach, supporter, and I, I would say he's, he's helped me beyond anyone else. So is there ever, and I'm going to maybe refer to Julie on this. Is there ever <laughs> From a race riding perspective, there, my, my there, mother has helped me. Oh. No, 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 that's not where I was going to go. Um, no, I would never do that. 
Is there any time in the Asmussen household where it's not horse centric? Like, do y'all talk shop at dinner? I think I think so. It's a it's a very happy medium. I, I do think there's a time and place. It's very professional here, but I mean, you had a bad day and you go home, and we're oh, what's on TV? <laughs> So it's not always going home, come on, Keith, sit down, we're going to watch replays. You know, that, that, that was a bad Steve Asmussen impression, but I mean, was that... No, it was, it was very nice of him to point out how to tune me out. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, uh, it's, the, it's the auditory blinkers thing that, that yeah. may go on. So obviously, you're, you're a little taller than most jockeys. Eric is as well. You did have to cut weight in order to get down to be able to ride. And Eric actually chose to ride with the bug, which is the weight allowance for jockeys just starting out. How did you, because there's a, there's a way to do it and then there's a way to do it healthy. How do you maintain weight? Uh, I think it's gotten easier than it ever has, just understanding what works and what doesn't through trial and error and just doing it for a prolonged period of time. My mother's been my biggest help in that dimension as far as you know, try, as you said, doing it a, in a healthy manner. And it, it's something I respect because it's not separate from riding. There's not reducing and riding. It is the same you thing. reduce to ride, yeah. it's, it's separate. And so I, I very much respect it and try to do it in a healthy manner to be able to ride for as long as possible because I do plan on doing this until it doesn't make sense. Well, you're gonna do it very well. After Oakland is over, our horse population goes across the entire country. You have stables at Churchill. What's your plan this summer? Uh, most likely return to Kentucky. Uh, following this meet last year, I went down to Lone Star Park, which is my home track, and it was a ton of fun given that my friends are there and I can get them all to go out to the races and stuff. But uh, I do believe Eric is going to go to Lone Star Park, and I'm going to push on to Kentucky. So do you have aspirations of going with your dad to uh, Saratoga? One thing at a time. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> Nancy. <laughs> yeah, so I, it's got to be kind of cool, especially for your mom, because I see you and Julie in, in wind pictures here the next day at Houston, the next day, you know, Kentucky. That's got to be really cool. It's like going to your kid's game. I mean, you're, you're the coach but it's gotta be cool to, to be out there and it's gotta mean a lot to your kids as well to show that parental support. Oh, I, I think everybody with kids that had in sports, uh, uh, me and Julie have a middle son, Darren, who's uh, between Eric and he excelled in sports and it, it's such a great sense of pride. I mean, um, always has been, continues to be and anybody with a kid who played any sport understands that. And, something that makes them happy they you know do with their friends and I think that those are some of our, our me and Julie's best memories are um, racing uh, for them and sporting events for Darren just to be a witness to it well obviously Eric grew up in the sport as well but the first time that you guys rode against each other I believe it was last fall or last September at Churchill yep. Did you give him any words of wisdom? Maybe not advice, but any, any? Oh yeah, it's it very brief. I just said, have fun. Yeah, it's, it's such an incredible experience to be able to ride a horse in a race. And it's, it's something I try not to take for granted. And I, it's just, have fun. But I, interestingly enough, Eric claimed horses and was an owner before he became a jockey. And one thing that Keith has said, He's got a great eye for pedigree, for confirmation. And you think, in, I think in an interview, correct me if I'm wrong, you thought that Eric might one day become a really successful trainer. It wouldn't surprise me. Eric's incredibly smart. He's the, the smart one, and I'm the educated one. <laughs> I like that no, you I, say I, that. I, I'm, because, just, I'm joking. Because some Eric, people will Eric say there's a difference. A, an incredible horseman. His eye for, just as you said, confirmation, and especially in, in the claiming aspect of the game, he is incredibly well versed on where, <laughs> as far as a plan goes, is claim this horse for this spot because of this, this, this. Like. So there was a, a really cool video of Darren Fleming, who's your longtime assistant over 30 years? Uh, to, to make the Around. connection, to make the connection. Yeah. Uh, Keith James. Yes. Right? Yes. My father's like name his is dad. Keith. Julie's dad's name is Jim. We have Keith James. Uh, second one, Darren Scott. 
after you know, Darren from, Fleming and Scott Blasey. Julie, from the time Julie was pregnant with the second one, she, I remember we were at Lone Star when she came and, and showed the sonogram and, you know, it's like okay to announce it and stuff. Darren called it Darren Scott from that moment on. So uh, I would have to say, yes, he's a huge part of so I can remember, the Asmussen family. I can remember when it was going around what you were going to name Darren Scott. We all thought it was a joke. Like, no, the guys are, the guys are going around telling everybody. Darren and Scott are telling everybody that. But that just shows how much of a part they are of your family. I, I, w I will tell on my mother on that one, you know, Julie. Uh, delivered Darren Scott. Everything is good. You leave the delivery room to call people and right. let everybody know that she's okay. My mom followed me out. She said, "Are you really going to name it Darren Scott?" <laughs> I can totally see Marilyn saying <laughs> yeah. that too. <laughs> I, I said, "Of course." And she said, "Well, what if what if you have a fall out? I said, "Well, then Texas will have one more Bubba." <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. But there is a video of Darren, because he ponied you on your first time to the starting gate in the afternoon. Yeah, senior Hogan. <laughs> and we asked Darren, did, what, what were your final words? And he said, put your goggles down. <laughs> so is that probably accurate? Very accurate. <laughs> you know, yeah. You're thinking a million things except for... <laughs> no, the, uh, all of the boys are just uh, so fortunate to have Darren and Scott and Pablo in their lives. and. You mentioned uh, me and Julie traveling, going to them. Uh, they've had parents every barn they've ever been in, whether it was me or Julie or not, that have, you know, that love them and look out for them and put them on the right path. If you have children that want to follow in your footsteps, what's going to be your words of wisdom for them? Uh, just make sure they have an understanding of, you know, the physical and emotional demands of it. I do believe it's a beautiful profession. I've always been extremely infatuated to it as far as, I mean, it's, it's something that's so beautiful to me just watching jockeys and, I mean, you add the art of race riding to it and it's something that I, I just, I, I believe is an art form and when done correctly is a spectacle that's very hard to emulate and it's, I, I would just, as far as advice goes, make sure they understand what it entails but not dissuade in any manner. Steve, you've obviously been under the, the spotlight for years. Maybe, I like to think maybe valid expectations really put you on that national spotlight. And that was many, many years ago. Now that you have your sons working with you, do you feel that's maybe made you a little softer? I wish it would. <laughs> I, I mean, it's... <laughs> Keith is over here saying no. Well, it, it needs to. You know, you, you, Julie reminds me of our many blessings constantly. And you, this is a sport where you, you, it has all of you. I mean, you yes. put everything into it. And um, what's every, all of them. They, they, it's 100%. All, all you have is 100%, and you got to give 100%. And that's who we are. Keith, working with your dad, getting instructions in, in the paddock or when he legs you up, do you ever in your mind say, oh, you know what, I don't want to take this horse to the lead. I'd really like to take this horse back. Or do you do, because it's always easier to do what the trainer tells you and get beat than to do what a jockey wants to do and maybe not have the outcome that they want. Is there is it a catch-22 sometimes? No, I, I believe my father has filled me with like unbounded confidence. I, I, I feel incredibly invigorated riding for him because he has such a level of confidence in me. I feel like I can make decisions without hesitation. Coming into the paddock today, Steve, for the Count Fleet, definitely potential Breeders' Cup winner. I mean, is there, do you, I mean, because a lot of times trainers go backwards. They go from maybe Breeders' Cup back to January. Is that is that is that the end target potentially? Uh, absolutely, and um, yeah, you absolutely you work from your main target um, backwards, and we you, it has taken horses like Matoli to win the Count Fleet in the past, and that plan worked out extremely well with a victory in the Breeders' Cup Sprint as well as an Eclipse Award for doing so, and. Uh, 
we, you try to emulate that level of success and luckily or fortunately uh, we're allowed the talented enough horses to make those sort of plans. An absolutely amazing third, well, equine family, the Asmussen family, the inspiration that your parents have given you, Julie's family, and now on to the next generation. So congratulations on an amazing career starting out because you've got one of the best, two of the best, in your dad and Wayne Lucas. So it's so cool to see that younger generation come up, thrive, be good at it, and be good human beings at the same time. Because the level of success that you've already had, you could be cocky or, but no, I'm serious, but the level of, of humbleness and social media can be a nightmare with your generation, but you've handled the success so well and your family is so proud of you. Oh, thank you. It's quite the compliment, Nancy. So I do want to thank Keith and Steve. Best of luck on today's card, and congratulations. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.